So welcome everyone to our December meeting for the Montana Accessibility Interest Group. It's wonderful to have Elaine uh, Ober and Rick Ferry here with us from Pearson. Uh, Elaine is the Director of Accessibility for Pearson's Global Higher Education Business and Rick is uh, Pearson Global Head of Accessibility Advocacy. So those are some great titles for Pearson. Uh, and great great positions. I'm sure you're doing wonderful things there and we're really looking forward to hearing the, the developments uh, that you've been working with. So um, those of you that want to ask questions, feel free to put those in the chat at any time or uh, just use the talk button and uh, be sure and, and ask your questions uh, in context of what Elaine and Rick are talking about. So I'll go ahead and turn the session over to both of you, Elaine and Rick. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you for inviting us. And Rick, I think it's best if you start off with the Global Accessibility Outreach and Training Center and some of the other uh, recent changes that part of which is the um, existence of the job that you now have. All right. Uh, thanks, Elaine. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for spending some time today. We're very excited to be able to tell you about the things going on at Pearson with accessibility. And even though <coughs> I may sound young, I've been around the block a few times. Uh, and I've been at Pearson, uh, I've actually on my third tour of duty, I've come and left twice. Uh, but I've been involved with accessibility at the company, even though I've had a number of different roles uh, over the years. I've always had a, a sort of a part to play in accessibility. In fact, I go far enough back that I was on the original National File Format panel with my friend George Kircher. <laughs> Uh, which then became the NIMAS, NIMAC in the K-12 space. Um, and about 18 months ago or so, John Fallon became the new CEO of the company. Marjorie Scardino stepped down. And he was talking about a number of things that, that he wanted to do with the company uh, to change sort of the, how Pearson operates at a global level. And one of the things he was keen about was accessibility and having the company, which has been doing a lot of good things with accessibility, but hasn't necessarily been very coordinated about it, uh, certainly not very talkative about it. Uh, so we started on a program, my role is new, uh, it started in January of this year, and I'm the head of accessibility advocacy, and I have a couple of components to my job. You know, I sort of divide it between an internal role and an external role. Uh, and externally, I spend a lot of time working with different groups. I work with National Federation of the Blind, American Printing House for the Blind. I work with a lot of the advocacy groups. I work with some of our customers. Um, I work with some of our technology suppliers as well as the sets of technology groups, you know, trying to find out what their issues are and to match those up with the products that we're producing inside to make sure they're accessible. And then my internal role is uh, working with our businesses and our product teams, helping them uh, in the ways that I can, uh, making sure that the things they're doing about accessibility are, are the right things and also that we, we present it to the audience and to our customers and our users in the right way. And so our group is brand new this year. Uh, we're part of something called the Accessibility Outreach and Training Center. Um, it's a global group. Uh, Suzanne Taylor runs that group. Um, and we have, as a company, committed to uh, WCAG uh, Level 2 AA uh, as, our, as our standards going forward. And we're in the process of rolling that standard out. Um, we also have our own Pearson, our internal Pearson digital learning guidelines for accessibility. Um, they are WCAG guidelines, but we actually have sort of adjusted them a little bit in the sense that, you know, for developers who aren't used to the WCAG spec, it can be a little daunting. And so these guidelines are written, um, of course they're in English, but they're written in ways that it's easier for folks to understand the context. It also allows us to add some things that we think are more appropriate for education. Uh, so we're in the process of rolling out uh, the policy I've done. Well, I don't know, probably 20 presentations uh, globally to folks in South Africa at Pearson uh, for the UK. I did one for uh, India recently. I know Elaine, and she can talk more about her role in this. And Elaine has done a number of uh, presentations for their higher ed, her higher ed uh, constituents. And basically, we're rolling out the program. The program has a couple parts. To it. One, it's, it's talking about WCAG, why that's the standard, why we, we want to work that standard how our products going forward will be accessible. And then we spent a lot of time with the teams. We've, we've embarked on an ambitious training program uh, for our developers. Uh, we're developing different specialists. 
uh, to help in the product development process. Uh, we're, in a, we're in an interesting situation right now where we have some older products uh, that we're migrating to different platforms. And so right now it's a little bit of a struggle for us because we have so many products and so many different offerings in the marketplace to sort of address them all at one time is, is challenging, to say the least. Uh, but we're working on it. And certainly our major products, and Elaine's going to talk some of those about, there's a commitment to accessibility. And not just uh, sort of a patch up at the end, but really um, right from the design phase. You know, we've been involved in, you know, have people on the ground have accessibility uh, skills and specialties uh, right in the product development phase. I think that's, that's really exciting for us. So I would say uh, stay tuned. Uh, more good things are going to be coming from Pearson. I think uh, throughout 2015, both in our higher ed space and our K-12 space, you'll start to see products coming out that really have great accessibility support built into them. Um, we're also working on improving our customer service and our outreach to folks. That's also going to take us some time, but that's something that Elena and I will be working on um, next year. And I unfortunately can't stay on. I'm going to stay on as long as I can. Uh, but if something occurs to you, you have questions afterwards, you'd like to know, know more details about what we're doing at the global level, um, Elaine has my contact information, or Marlene probably has it. Uh, so please feel free to call me, email me. Uh, happy to answer any questions uh, that you have, and also just your feedback on how things are working from your perspective with Pearson products, and any ideas or, or thoughts you have about um, you know, making making uh, our products better for, for folks that have those disabilities. You know, when I took this role, I'll leave you with this comment. When I took this role, I said I hoped that I was out of a job in two years. I would hope that but sometime at the end of 2015 going into 16, that a lot of my, my harder work will be done because the company will be on the right path, and then I can work on some of the more forward-looking things uh, around our products. So I know that's an ambitious Probably slightly silly to tell the company that you'd like not to have a job in two years. What I mean it is sort of to make the point that, that with the commitment the company's making, accessibility should be built in and sort of organic to how our products work for all our users. Um, and that's the goal. And that's certainly what, what I try to do every day when I come in. So I'll, I'll stop for a moment ask, and uh, ask her, ask him to talk, answer any questions anyone has right now before I turn it back to the lane. Rick, I okay, really appreciate know. the fact that you're willing to stay in touch with us and get uh, feedback from us. I, I really appreciate that. And I see Kari Cohen has asked in the chat, what is your contact information? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put that in the chat right now so everyone has it. Great. Thank you, Rick. Lane, did I forget anything? No, I think that's great. Thank you. Um, so if there are no more questions at this time, um, I'll take over and move through the rest of the topics that uh, Marlene and I had identified earlier this week. Uh, just a word about me. I've spent my almost my entire professional career in higher education publishing. I developed content. I've produced in my career thousands of books across all disciplines. Um, and always really been a little bit connected to accessibility. Um, and then a few years ago, I was lucky enough to be able to attend the CSUN convention. Um, so this was 2011. And I came back from it realizing that while Pearson was doing an adequate job addressing accessibility in terms of the functionality of our product, no one was paying any attention at all to the content. And I'm not a technical person. I'm an editorial person. I'm a word person. And so I made a case for a new position, which is a position I now hold, um, that would really work with the editorial team so that the content that they're developing can be accessible um, when it goes into our technology product, which over time is becoming more and more accessible itself from a functionality perspective. Um, so that's kind of what I do and where my position came from. Um, very early on, I realized that one of the biggest accessibility challenges that we face 
is that we have far too many technology platforms through which this content is delivered. And each one is a little different. Each one has strengths and weaknesses. And as a result of the reorganization that Rick was referring to um, and John Fallon's desire to um, have us be a company that produces accessible products that has a high level of efficacy for our customers, um, we are embarking on a, on a plan to significantly cut back on these platforms so that we'll have a small number of core platforms. They will be developed to be born accessible. And that work has just begun, I mean, really just. Um, so I don't have a time frame, but I do have a high degree of confidence that we'll be successful in this. So that now, as I work with the editorial teams on their content, um, there's a much more optimistic feeling that, yeah, we're doing this wonderful stuff to our content. We're writing image descriptions, and um, we're going to start doing described video. And it's going to be really terrific because as the platforms that provide the functionality are replaced, um, it will all result in a really good experience for um, for your students, who, frankly, I consider to be my students as well. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, a broad higher ed view of things. Um, but we do have products that are out there today. And they have, each one has a slightly different accessibility profile. And we're definitely making accessibility um, improvements to many of these. So I know that uh, my math lab is used on at least some of your campuses. And it is, in fact, one of our most successful MyLab products. Um, and it's on a platform that is used across many other MyLabs particularly in business, English, foundations. Um, so when I talk about some of these changes and improvements, these are platform level improvements. And so they will the benefits will flow to any product that utilizes that platform. So I think the biggest and most exciting one is that the the player that was in that platform that serves up the questions that the students use in my math lab, my econ lab, and so forth, um, has up until now been a flash player. And while we were able to work with Adobe, um, they gave us access to their code a few years ago. And we were able to make it somewhat accessible. It still had many problems. So they've completely rebuilt the player in HTML5. And it's going to be released in January for a lot of internal testing. Um, it's still not quite stable. And then right now they're targeting April for a live date where um, customers would begin to see this in their courses. Um, so it, it will have a lot of benefits, um, among others, um, or among many. It will allow native browser zoom and magnification to be used. Um, we, we've had a lot of people ask about that. And also, um, native contrast schemes can be applied. So if there's an operating system level contrast scheme that a user particularly likes, they can switch to it and it will be applied to what serves up on that player. Um, in addition, the content teams are continuing to add alt text to images within the questions and other content. And overall, increasing the number of questions and question types that are accessible. Um, and, and finally, in terms of all of these uh, my labs that sit on this particular platform. The platform team 
is working on ways to make even more question types accessible. Um, one one of the developers emailed me about is questions that have embedded controls. They couldn't really make these accessible in Flash, but now that they've moved to HTML5, this is possible, so they're going to start working on it. So, you know, as I say, they're targeting April for these courses to start reflecting the, the new changes. Um, and certainly, by the time, you know, classes resume in August of 2015, this should be pretty well established. So we're really excited about that. Um, any questions? Okay. I'll go on to my management lab because I know certainly at the University of Montana this is in use. And um, over the past six months, we have been working um, pretty hard on certain bits of content and also player things. Um, so the latest update, which I just got earlier this week, is that the simulations are now accessible. And we have a plan to move the video to a more accessible player. Some of it is currently on the new player. Some of it is not. So they're developing a plan to uh, finish that work. Um, some of the content is some kind of um, international business, I think, special simulation. Um, those are currently under review, and the team will develop a remediation plan. One of the problem areas we had in my management lab and in other business labs was a, uh, was a tool or an assessment thing called Quick Test, and we just retired that, so that will no longer be a problem. Um, the self-assessment library is being completely revised and will be accessible in time for um, back to school 2015. And the dynamic study modules, which are in my management lab and in my econ lab and possibly in some of the other business labs, that's not actually a Pearson product. It's a third-party um, set of content. And we have been working closely now with that developer to develop a plan to make those accessible. Um, again, targeting back to school um, 2015, if not earlier. So any questions? Oh, the tool, it's called Quick Prep. And I'm not entirely sure what role it plays in my management lab. But if anyone needs more information about that, I'll talk to um, my management lab. The business team, I mean, all the teams are embracing accessibility, but the business team has been incredibly active um, over the past few months. And it's really exciting to me um, the progress that they're making. So my econ lab, I don't know if any of your campuses use it, um, but it has definitely had some accessibility issues over the years. And we're starting to make some real progress. Again, the videos are being moved to the new player. And that work started a little earlier for my econ lab. So they're pretty sure they'll be done um, in March or April. And once that happens, it flows automatically to all of the live courses. Um, the content team is continuing to add um, all text to images in the test item bank. And there are hundreds of thousands of those questions. So, you know, they, make, they just try to make steady progress. And we have a little, you may have seen it, we have a little um, accessibility icon. It looks sort of like an ear, not very much, but a little bit like an ear, or at least the sound wave. Um, and it's blue. And it sits next to all the questions that are accessible um, in all of these my labs. So the number of those, you know, they keep, questions keep sprouting the little ear icon. 
The homework questions are currently being reviewed. Um, most of them are already accessible, but there's a small percentage in each one, each my lab that isn't. Um, so they're working on those. Again, the dynamic study mo modules, um, the same, it's the same code that's used for the management ones and the econ ones, and we're working with that vendor. And in my econ lab, there are real-time data exercises, and those have graphs. And for those, they're also targeting March and April to complete the accessibility work. So, you know, as your instructors um, build their courses, as these accessibility improvements uh, flow out, they'll start to show up in the in the courses that the students are using. Any questions on my econ lab? Elaine, if I could just go back, you were saying that you're working on described video. Um, so that's audio descriptions for for questions, correct? It's audio description for um, for videos that need it. A lot of our video is, in fact, has a, either complete narration or many times for the animation um, that are also video. The text appears on the screen, but there are some where there is important information that's only conveyed visually. So for those we're starting next year, we're going to um, you know, slowly but surely uh, put in audio description. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. I don't know how far we'll get um, in the soft side of my lab um, because we're introducing some new products that will ultimately replace those. I'll get to that later, but certainly um, on the hard side videos. Uh, we're moving towards audio description when we Great. need it. And we're excited about that because we've never done it before. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> So I'm sure that many of your campuses use um, one or more of our mastering products, which is the, uh, the foremost technology product for our Science list. Um, mastering also has had its accessibility issues over the years, and frankly, continues to have many. But at the same time, the mastering team is working very hard on a lot of things. Um, right now, they're focusing on the student-facing assignment components because we know those are very important, and. The content developers are working on adding alt text to images in existing assignment components. And new ones are expected to, to happen. So um, that's a significant change. Also, the, um, the mastering content development team uh, commissioned a set of model examples across all the disciplines in mastering. Um, to focus on the end of chapter assessment questions and what the best way is to add alt text to them. Because we want that to be consistently and correctly done. We don't want to copy and have the alt text inadvertently get rid of the answer. Um, so those model examples have just been completed and they'll be um, rolled out to the um, to the um, vendor who creates these assessment items based on what's in the in the uh, corresponding textbook, and that should that should really make the end of chapter assessment and mastering a whole lot more accessible. And there's also a major development effort underway. Um, to build a new platform that will essentially replace mastering, and it will be one of those core platforms that I referred to earlier. And those have been developed to be born accessible, and all the hard work that the content teams are doing on the content 
um, when the new platform is ready, and we've developed a sort of sunsetting plan for existing mastering, um, it, it, it will be a really good experience for the students. Okay. Um, now, Marlene, you had mentioned that my labs plus are in use at your campus. I don't know if it is or they are um, at any of the other campuses represented here, but I did do some digging because it's not a product I really know a lot about. And I discovered the reason for that is because it's essentially just the integration of an existing MyLab or Mastering product and our learning management system platform, which is known as Learning Studio. And I will I will share with uh, Marlene, and you can you know share it out with this group. Um, the DPAD that was done for Learning Studio um, at the end of July of this year, and Learning Studio is in fact one of our most accessible um, products platforms. Um, it it supports all of the applicable accessibility criteria, either fully or with minor exceptions. Um, and I went back and talked by email to some of the people on the Learning Studio team. And it, it was about a two-year effort to get it to this point. Um, so that should work. That LMS should work pretty well, obviously, depending on which my lab or mastering product is being with it, whatever accessibility issues that has um, are not going to go away. But, but the, uh, the underlying LMS platform should be really good. Um, so I see Rick has stopped off. Any questions on anything so far? So Elaine, I appreciate your talking about MyLabs Plus, and I also don't know how much that's used on other campuses. Um, but thank you for sending the VPAT along. And if other people uh, would like that, please send me an email, and I'll, I'll send that out. Uh, Rick, thanks for joining us. I see Rick has has left. Um, and. Elaine, I'm assuming we can stay in touch with you on on uh, these products and uh, stay tuned on on any pro problems oh, yes. we're encountering or any developments you're seeing there. Oh yes, that um, that, that goes without saying. Um, <coughs> that's, that's very much what I'm here for. Um, okay, so another important um, thread in our accessibility initiative in higher ed, and across all of this, really, um, is because of the new policy that was rolled out in July, which very clearly states that all new products must be developed to be born accessible and meet the WIG Tech 2.0 level AA guidelines. Um, that also applies to existing content that's going to be moved into or repurposed into new products. So this has finally prompted a flurry of accessibility audits and DPAT creation and other documentation creation amongst the product team, which is a real blessing for me because it gives me good solid documentation to share with you. Um, so the business groups, the math and stat groups, IT, English, Foundation, and Arts and Sciences have all completed and um, have made available third party DPATs for their products. And when, when we know that a problem that's brought up in the DPAT is either going to be addressed or is in the process of being addressed, we annotate the VPAT to let the customers know. Um, and other disciplines such as world languages um, and, and mastering overall um, just have not, have not done VPATs yet. 
It may not because their platform will be replaced. Um, but they have finally kind of updated and upgraded their accessibility documentation. So that's um, available on request. I would like to make it sort of open access, but we're also redoing all of our websites at the moment. So the web information team asked me to hold off. Um, and then we've got several audits that are planned for 2015, um, one of which will be for writing space, which is a technology component that's in several my labs, I think in some mastering products, and in other technology products. Um, it sits within the English group, but it's used by many disciplines. And we really want to see where it's at. And if there are gaps, we, we definitely want to close them. That's an important component. Um, and then we're also undergoing or initiating an audit of our um, the integration tools that we've um, created for third-party LMSs. So if you want to integrate a MyLab product into your campus's LMS of choice, whether it's Blackboard, Canvas, D2L, or Moodle, uh, we have an integration tool for that. So we're going to start out and do reviews on the standard version of the integration tool and then move to a custom version. So those will be happening throughout 2015. Um, okay. So the next thing I want to talk about, because I'm not sure if any of you have encountered these, although if you have students using my math lab, um, some of our English labs, we probably have because they're embedded within the my lab. So for several years now, um, starting in 2012 actually, so a couple of years, we have been creating a post-production activity from our parent textbook, um, accessible ebooks in HTML and non-ML. We started in math, and there are over a hundred available now in math and staff. Then we moved to English, and there are a few dozen available in reading and writing, and also for student success. Um, and then, it, in a somewhat strategic fashion, we created these for books in major course areas such as intro science or intro sociology, um, intro to business, marketing, across a variety of disciplines. And in most cases, they are linked within the MyLab. They're not always easy to find, unfortunately. And when they're not, we can provide a link to them in the PDFs that we regularly provide upon request, as you know, for your students with disabilities. Um, they're, very, they're very plain, basic HTML, and the math is encoded in MathML. So in order to play that, you do have to be using a PC and Internet Explorer um, to download the uh, player. Um, we we know from you know our customers that students like them, BSS staff like them, but they do represent you know an alternate format. But our goal is is to have our our e-text, um, whatever our ebook is, available in some way as an accessible ebook. So that everyone, all students will be getting the same ebook. Um, we really want to move away from the alternate format model. We know it'll take us some time, but um, that is our plan. I see your question, Marlene, and um, 
Yes. We, it, it's a little complicated right now. Um, anyway, let me finish the, the HTML ebook. Um, if you're interested in learning more about them, send me an email and I will send you the list of all that are available. And that's really the easiest way right now um, to, to do this. Um, I'm also hoping to work with Access Network so that they can put a note in the book record saying that an HTML ebook is available. So, so now, as partly to answer Marlene's question about EPUB 3, I'm going to move into our um, new products. One of them is the next generation version of our search of eText, which we're calling eText 2.0. And this will be, in, so this platform is being developed to be accessible. It's, the team is working very hard on that, even as we speak. And eText 2.0 itself will be the ebook that's embedded in our technology product. The master file that creates that can generate an EPUB 3. And we know that our channel partners, such as Vital Source, um, will be getting this file. And their deliverable is an EPUB 3. And in the case of Vital Source, a very accessible one. So first time out, we will not be offering EPUB 3 sort of standalone from, from Pearson, but we will be offering them through our channel partners. And I hope, kind of after the first release um, of the ETH 2.0, um, I hope that we will be able to offer um, native indigenous Pearson ETH 3. That's not the immediate plan. We want to get the embedded ebook solid and stable. Um, and then we'll then we'll try to improve upon that. So that's kind of our EPUB 3 strategy. Um, it would be better if we could do it right out of the gate, but because of the embedded nature of these in the not have, um, they they want to hold off. Another new product, and this is really um, it's really exciting. Um, our brand new kind of next generation product is something that they're calling Revel. And it's a digital learning tool for higher education students that takes the place of both the printed textbook and existing online learning tools for general studies courses. So for example, right now a psychology instructor may use um, a textbook, printed or electronic, however he or she wants, as well as my site lab. So you have the textbook content embedded with embedded as a freestanding ebook within the my lab, but it's still quite separate. The assessments are in the MyLab. They're not kind of contiguous with the content. So in a Rebel book, what you have is a completely integrative, immersive, and interactive learning experience where the text, the assessments, illustrations, videos, interactive activities, and other types of rich media stuff. Um, it's all there in a single interface. And the development team for Revel has from the very beginning been completely committed to accessibility. Um, they've, they've been, they've really been trying to do it right from the beginning so that this tool will be more accessible. And when the product first did use in January, um, in selected disciplines, it will be highly, highly accessible. 
I will continue to improve this continue to read. Um, I had thought that I might try to do a little walkthrough of um, a few pages in Rebel today, but but I don't have time to do a really good job. And I actually think it would be more useful for you um, if, if we do this perhaps another time, or I could do it for different subgroups of you. Um, and you could invite some of your instructors in the disciplines where we have this product who could see it as well. Um, so that's something to think about. But uh, some of what I can tell you the team has done is, um, as I was playing around with it just the other day, is it's fully keyboard accessible. Um, you can tap through everything and interact with the link. There are um, all the video is captioned. It's not yet audio described, but that'll be phase two that we do starting next year. Um, the all of the static images, when they need it, have image descriptions. And the tables are fully navigable. Many of the interactive exercises are, um, are navigable as well. I was looking at an accessible drag and drop um, the other day. What, what we've done for some of these is built um, an alternate version that you can access with just um, a link and interact with that link to bring up the um, accessible version. And it basically uses the principles of table navigation to um, for the user to execute the drag and drop activity. So that's exciting. And some of the other interactives have been made accessible. We haven't quite figured out how to do all of them. As you know, it's, it's very difficult to you know, make interactive, dynamic content accessible. Um, so that's a big focus of what we're going to be doing in 2015 across all of our disciplines, um, not just for the regular product, but certainly that will be at the top of the list. Um, so some of the disciplines already available or that will be available in Rebel for um, January of psychology, sociology, um, interpersonal communication, public speaking, oh dear, um, music, art history, and others that I can't think of right now. Um, so if you'd like to have a walkthrough for your campus, um, email me about that because um, we, we know that this is going to be a really good experience for, for your students and for your faculty, too, I think. Um, and if you're at all interested in testing it out for us, we would be really, really happy to work so, with you on that. So any yes, Elaine, I have a thoughts? question. So if one of the campuses here uh, asked you to come and do a walkthrough, uh, what would that involve? How would you do that walkthrough with th their faculty? Um, I think the most efficient way, I have to check with the REPL marketing team about this, because they might want one of their folks to be involved as well. But I would probably work with one of the local sales representatives and learning technology specialists who could be physically present and then um, I and probably one of our accessibility specialists would, um, would run the demo um, remotely. Okay, great. So um, on our Montana Accessibility Interest Group website, you'll find Elaine's contact information if you're interested in, in doing that. Um, we could do it here uh, also through, you know, I'd love to have you back when, when these products are uh, Released and not in lockdown, and when your website's uh, back uh, current and up and running. Uh, but is your um, method of doing your walkthrough different than using something like Blackboard Collaborate? Probably not. I think it would work quite well doing the web tour. 
okay, well, we definitely want to have you back here, but I hope um, other campuses will consider uh, pulling your faculty into a, a presentation, too. I know we'd like to do that with our faculty here. Yeah, I think, I think it's a good experience because um, it helps them understand that you're an important part of their adoption decision. And it, it lets them see the, um, some of the features of the product in a slightly different light. Um, you know, kind of less about them and more about the students. So um, I'm, I'm also going to send to you, Marlene, and, and feel free to post it on the uh, interest group site, the list of um, sales reps and learning technology specialists for, as far as I can tell, these are the four groups that cover Montana schools. Oh, that'd be great. We, we'd be happy to post that on that particular web uh, page that we've built for you. Good. Um, because those are, especially the learning technology specialists, are folks that you can call or email if you've got a problem. And if they can't help, well, they usually contact me. And of course, you can do that directly. But if you want someone to, you know, call on you, those would be the folks who would do it. And um, I, I do urge all of the reps and, and learning technology specialists to include disability services offices in their calls on campus. But it's only a small percentage of them who actually do. So I'm hoping to. I'm hoping to up my numbers on that over the course of the next year as I also roll out some um, targeted training for our sales force. So the last, um, the last piece of our higher ed initiative is something I call the Accessibility Advisory Network. And setting this up has been my dream since I took this job in 2011. Um, and I think finally in 2015, I will have the resources I need to, um, to start making it happen. Pretty much all of our disciplines have something called a faculty advisor network. And these are pretty basic user communities of faculty who are teaching with Pearson's digital products. And they share their problems, their successes, the results on best practices, you know, through the network. And they also take part in ongoing product development um, with our product development team. And my plan is to use this model to build a network of disability services and assistance technology folks like all of you um, from, from institutions who would like to partner with us in accessibility, especially in terms of product development. Um, so helping us with product development is one part of it, but also we want to help you understand how, what the accessibility profile is of individual products and how to help your students get the most out of it when there are problems to work with you on workarounds that can then be kind of socialized through other campuses um, over the country. Um, so that if, so it doesn't take as long as it sometimes can to figure out the best path for a student who's having trouble with a particular thing. Um, so that's one part of it. And then the other part of it is um, through this network, finally having more of a presence um, in head at both the national and regional levels because we think that having a more, a higher profile in that organization will help us get the word out to more and more of our customers. I consider all the assistive and assistive technology people out there my customers. Um, to be able to um, get you what you need faster and learn from you as well how we can improve. So does that sound like a good idea to all of you? Okay, thank you, Janet. <laughs> um, as I say, our reps and learning technology specialists don't always call on you. And 
I'm, I'm just trying to figure out the best ways to, um, oh, thank you, Christy, um, to, have, to have conversations like this and real kind of co-learning where we learn more about what your key points are and we help you figure out, you know, how to attack our product so that your students, um, your students can learn. Um, so any other questions? Um, I'm pretty close to the end of the hour. I definitely want to answer whatever questions you may have. Um, are there any suggestions you have for you know, product to use on your campus that are problematic? Um, I can do research into them and see what we have planned. It's just been pretty much um, science and business oriented. Um, Nancy has her hand up, uh, and then I have a question to Elaine. Okay, so um, well, Carrie has a question. How when can you set up a web demonstration? Um, it would probably be sometime um, no earlier than the middle of January. So I can be in touch. Um, I can be in touch with you about that. Or if you email me, then I'll have your email and, and we can get to work. And Carrie, you're in Portland, correct? Um, so, um, yeah, I know the, uh, the Learning Technology Specialist is the same one for um, Portland as well as Montana. And he is very um, proactive about all of this. So I'm sure we can set something up. Yeah, it would be, it would be um, no earlier than the middle of January. I don't think they'll have the final version released until early January, and then they'll want to see how stable it is. Yeah, Nancy has her hand up. Thank you. Yes, I have a, a management professor who will be using my management lab to some extent. I don't know exactly what she plans to do with it, but I'm guessing she'll be um, possibly using the simulations. And did I hear you correctly that those are accessible? Yes. Yes, that's the latest word from um, the business technology team. So those okay. are now accessible. Um, depending on the age of the course, um, so I think the accessible simulations will roll out with the with, with the courses that release at the end of this month. So you may need to load. No, I think it automatically slows. Okay, to yeah, and this is the course, course that'll start uh, uh, January fifth, I believe. So, and she does have a a blind student identified in the course. So we want to make sure we can. Um. If you, if you can let me know, um, just email me about um, what textbook goes along with that okay. in my lab. And did you put your email up in the chat? Okay. Um, I need it's that. on the Montana Accessibility Interest Group okay. website as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. So, Eileen, I have a, a question for you. Um, you were saying in my math lab, You've got alt text for images, and I'm assuming you're, you're talking about like charts and things like that, maybe visual visual things. But what about the math equations? Are those uh, how are you dealing with actual math equations? You're not putting alt tags for images there, are you? No. Um, in the HTML ebook. The math equations, all the math is included in MathML. And I believe it is in the native like math lab exercises as well. I'll have to double check on that because for some reason I can never keep that fast in my brain. Oh. So, okay, thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? I see a number of people are typing in the chat, so um, 
some thank yous. Uh, we'll wait and see. I'm not sure if Kathy's typing or not. Okay. So it looks like the the questions have all been asked, Elaine. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all this information with us and uh, being willing to stay connected with us uh, as you move forward with this rollout. Uh, I think this will make a, a big difference in terms of what faculty are using in their in their course content. So uh, really appreciate this. Look forward to having you back for another webinar um, later in the winter time in 2015. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much for um, thank you so much for reaching out and asking. Um, it, it it just helps us to, to be connected because we're here for you and your students and um, we don't do a good job of promoting what we do. <laughs> so thanks thanks to all of you for um, for listening and email me when you when you need me. Sounds good, Elaine. Thanks, and um, everyone have a good day. Our next meeting is January 2nd, right after the first of the year, but I hope you'll be able to join us for a discussion, possibly uh, focusing on our State eLearning Conference XLI 2015. Um, so uh, thank you again, Elaine. I hope you all have a, a good rest of the semester. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.